Okay, we're honored to have another speaker from Iowa on the program today. And uh, Dr. Marshall McDaniel is an associate professor at Iowa State and his re research centers around nutrient cycling, the biota involved, and how humans can either interfere or enhance those soil and plant relationships. And his talk today is entitled Nitrogen Management in the Context of Soil Health. So thank you for coming today. So Brian's talk was a perfect precursor to this because I'm going to talk about some alternative ways to get nitrogen other than fertilizer. And does anybody know what this crop is over here next to corn? Somebody, I heard somebody say it, alfalfa. That's right. So I'm going to talk about some results from a long-term experiment near Boone, Iowa that uh, I've taken over from a colleague of mine. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more details about it. First, I want to give acknowledgement to that colleague. So he was a weed ecologist, now a professor emeritus at Iowa State, Matt Liebman. Uh, he started this experiment that I'm going to show you some data from. And I also want to acknowledge Matt Woods. He's the guy rocking the guitar right there in front of the John Deere. Um, he's a musician, but agronomist and makes all the things happen in the field. Like we need uh, many people like that to make our research happen, correct? And I also want to acknowledge some other folks I've, I've used data from um, and the funders that have made this research possible as well. All right, so what I'm going to, and I'm going to try to get us back on time too. I, uh, I, I purposely have my timer up and I'm going to hit it and try to stay on time. I'm going to talk about uh, the background and the problem we've got. Then I'm going to talk about uh, what Fabian, I also want to thank Fabian for inviting me to come and speak to you all. I'm going to talk about the connection between nitrogen management and soil health and in the context of this long-term experiment that um, also has to do with fertilizer prices, as we just heard from Brian. And I'm going to spare you all this, but in case anybody is really interested in uh, CO2 burst tests, um, you can email me. I, I, I think I have a recorded talk from the Alta meeting a while ago that goes over that more detail. Nancy was there. Um, she can tell you more about it as well. So I met her there. And if I can't get to any questions today that you have, or you wanna find out more about my research group or this experiment, you can follow us at Twitter or email me, marsh at iastate.edu. Um, and then the Twitter handles at soil underscore plant underscore IXNS, which is just abbreviation for interactions, soil plant interactions. Okay, so I know as Iowans, we're pretty full of ourselves. We like to say this a lot. I don't know if Minnesota has a, a saying sim similar to this, but as Iowa farms, so farms the nation. So there's, even though this trend is for Iowa, it's similar for other Midwest states, including, I haven't looked at uh, uh, Minnesota's uh, um, uh, data, but I'm sure it looks somewhat like this. This is a proportion of cropland in uh, corn and soy, mostly corn in the earlier half of this century timeline um, and small grains. And the small grains have dove off the cliff and the corn and soybeans has increased. And so now we're kind of where we are today with uh, corn and soybeans making up 95% or more of Iowa and hay being a, a very steady but low uh, proportion of, of cropland in the state. Uh, there are many factors to this. Some are at the higher level, political economic factors, one of my colleagues thinks that there's one factor that's most important to this, and it's the tractor. As soon as the uh, tractors were introduced, there wasn't a need for horses to pull plows anymore. And um, then we got rid of the small grains and a lot of other crops that we'll talk about. And, and there are, like I said, there are many complicated ones, uh, and, but I'm not gonna go into that. What I wanna talk about today is really what might be the benefits we're missing out on including that third crop or alfalfa in rotation. What the farmers I work with call it grandpa's rotation, right? Many of you might've heard that term before for uh, alfalfa and small grains included in this. Okay, so a little bit of, of context here. We do a lot of corn and soybeans and we do it really well, right? That I don't have to convince you of. We've talked about it today. You've heard about it uh, elsewhere. 
but it's come at a cost. And there's something that, you know, as human beings, we all have a lot of biases, even scientists, we try to act objectively, but one of the biases we have as human beings is something called progress bias. And this is the act of overstating or overvaluing uh, the positive actions while downplaying the negative ones. And I'm an optimist. I'm generally an optimist. I don't like to think of the negative ones, but there are some negative actions. And besides Iowa beating Minnesota for many things, we're number one in the nation for soil erosion. Um, and so a wicked problem is a, uh, a, an, an intractable problem or a problem that's really tough to solve, right? So erosion has been a, a long time, long standing tough uh, problem. Loss of wildlife habitat. There are folks I work with at Iowa State that are, are more uh, honed in on that wicked problem. Local regional water quality. Uh, um, I work a little bit in that area just because of the context of soil fertility, soil health and, and uh, fertility management. 50% um, decline in soil organic matter over the past couple centuries. And then socioeconomics that I'm not gonna go into, although I need to, to maybe adjust this slide a little bit after Brian's talk, uh, since the, the profit margin was increased this year compared to relative years. But all of these wicked problems have some solutions. These are not all the solutions, but no tillage, cover crops, diversified perennial rotations, uh, those don't necessarily cover the loss of wildlife habitat. There are other practices for that, maybe marginal lands converting to CRP. Um, but there are many uh, practices that can solve some of these issues. And I want to talk about, in particular, this decline in soil organic matter, because even though we might not see it with our naked eyes, um, this one is really at the crux of the issue with soil health and the, the nitrogen context of it. Okay, so a little bit more history. So prior to Euro-American history, uh, uh, Euro, uh, Euro American colonization. So there's this is a timeline. It has no scale because it would be a very, very long scale going back to 10,000 years. And then when Euro American cultivation happens, when the, the plow hit the fields at zero, right? So this is in the Des Moines lobe. Not all soils are like this, but in where Iowa State is, Story County, uh, Iowa. Um, about 12 to, to 17,000 years ago, the Wisconsinian glacier receded. Our high organic matter soils began to form. Here's a picture of Des Moines Lobe from the Iowa perspective, but that there are soils formed here in southern Minnesota that are also part of this uh, landform region and soil um, uh, parent material. Then we know that there were native folks farming for three to 4,000 years before Euro-American settlers. Um, we don't have good agronomic uh, uh, data on how their practices affected farm fields, but they mostly farmed along riverbanks to, because they were, they were fertile and they had a source of water. So this shows you archeological sites in Iowa that where native folks were farming. Your American cultivation begins, and now we know that we've lost about 50% soil organic matter, more or less. This is based on research from all over the Midwest, um, including experiments like the Morrow plots in Illinois, probably the, one of the most famous long-term experiments on soil organic matter, soil carbon. And the, the most important thing is this isn't just a loss in soil organic matter, but it's a loss in what I call soil ecosystem services, or the, and I'll explain what I mean by that in just a moment. But again, I, I'm not here to become the doom and gloom and the doomsayer here. I think this, I look at this as a glass is half full rather than a half empty. And I think we have a lot of opportunity and this is why you hear everybody from university to government agencies, to not NGOs, to industry talking about soil health and regenerative ag, right? And that's what this, the, both these movements, soil health and regenerative, regenerative ag are all about. They're about change, a management intervention and improving where we are now to where we could be in the future, right? Are we improving soil organic matter and those ecosystem services at this trajectory, at this trajectory, this trajectory, or maybe not, maybe we're flat even after a management change. That's what all this monitoring and hype is all about. Okay, so a little bit more about what I mean by soil ecosystem services. So these are, this is one of my favorite, I showed this in my soil fertility class. I showed this to 
to farmers when I, I travel around the state of Iowa. Um, this is from the Food and Agriculture Organization, and it's a pinwheel of eco soil ecosystem services. Some we care more about than others that are related to environmental science or agronomy. Those I've highlighted in red with uh, soil organic matter in the central pinwheel there, because it's related to all of these in one way or another. There are other ecosystem services there that archaeologists care about, like cultural heritage or engineers, foundation for human infrastructure, but provisioning food, fiber, and fuel, that first one kind of at about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, that's the primary directive, prime directive for those Star Trek fans out there of agronomy. But then I see Jeff shaking his head. He's a, he's a Star Trek fan. Um, but there are other ones that we're starting to think about a lot more, right? So carbon sequestration is the one that's getting all the hype and all the money. I see some people laughing. Uh, but there are other ones that we should be thinking about. Water purification, climate regulation. This means other greenhouse gases. Nutrient cycling. That's the one I'm going to focus on today. Uh, habitat for organisms. I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit. And flood regulation. Those are all other important things soils do for us besides provisioning fuel, fiber, and food, or sequestering carbon. All right, so let's talk a little bit how about more of the details of how to restore soil organic matter in those ecosystem services. I like to use this, uh, many of you might've seen this before, this is the five principles of soil health from the NRCS, I borrowed this. I've seen versions of this where they pare it down to four rather than five, but I like the five. Soil armor, and some of these are a little more self-explanatory than others. Soil armor means having a cover so you don't erode soils, right? Minimizing disturbance, tillage is a major disturbance factor, compaction as well. Plant diversity, so including more plants in rotation. Continual live living plant roots, I sometimes call that perenniality. That's a, a, a major factor many people are, are interested in with cover crops. And then the final one is livestock integration. And then I'm just going to show you some of the practices that can fall under these. So including a cover crop, perennial crops, leaving more residue, reducing tillage, all helps with soil armor, uh, under minimizing disturbance, any reduced tillage practice, lowering compaction through controlled traffic farming, uh, and then also re uh, 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 restoring to CRP or, or, or using prairie strips is a practice I've done some research on. Um, using cover crops in, in mixtures, crop rotations, intercropping, uh, CRP and prairie strips, again, cover many of these. Cover crops, you can also see cover many of these principles, uh, as in the perenniality. Um, using perennial crops, relay cropping, uh, using, planting a winter crop. And then finally, livestock, you could do it directly. I, I work with some farmers in Iowa that, that graze. Uh, uh, cover crops or might in, uh, introduce pastures and graze and rotation. Um, or I kind of consider adding manure a direct or an indirect way of um, integrating livestock rather than using synthetic fertilizer. And so the, the rotation I'm going to talk about today covers many of these, not the min minimized disturbance so much, but diversified perennial rotations like grandpa's rotation with alfalfa and small grains covers many of these principles. Okay, so let me return to the seven soil ecosystem services that we think about uh, more than some of those other ones. So provisioning food, fiber, and fuel, cycling of nutrients, and that, that one I'm gonna spend more, most of my time talking about, regulating flood, meaning improving infiltration and reducing water that's running off as kind of shown with this icon. My student, by the way, created these icons uh, habitat for organism, meaning the soil is, is a, a place where there could be more uh, 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 living organisms like microbes. In this case, she drew a bacteria here and living under the house. Water purification, so um, removing chemicals and, and uh, 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 pollutants from water, rainwater. Climate regulation, I mentioned that one, and storing carbon. And that's the one today that gets all the attention because of carbon markets, and we put a price on it. And you know, that we don't have Byron, or sorry, Byron, Brian, our, our economist here, um, he, uh, uh, he might be able to tell you that there is value in some of these other ones. We just don't have a monetary value to it. But I hear from a lot of growers about being able to get out early in the field. So this flood, uh, regulating flooding uh, when using cover crops or other practices. But like I said, I'm, I'm here to talk more about 
the connection with soil health and cycling nutrients. So for the remainder of this, except aside from a, just a quick snapshot of some other, um, some other measurements of soil health we've made, uh, I'm gonna spend it mostly on nitrogen. But before I do that, let me give some context on this experiment. So this is called the Marsden Agroecosystem or Agricultural Diversity Experiment. Uh, there are three cropping systems. I'll explain those in a moment. The plots are 60 feet wide by 276 feet long. There's four blocks or four replicates. And each one of the important things about this experiment is that each phase of the crop rotation is included. That's why you see more than three um, you see more than three uh, plots here uh, per each block. That's because one of every phase of the rotation is in here. My colleague, uh, now Professor Emeritus, Matt Lieben, established this in 2001 in central Iowa near Boone. And this, uh, the Marsden kind of farm ethos is that it's a long-term, even though Matt's a weed ecologist and he started this uh, to measure weeds, it's now evolved into uh, a, a, a longer term experiment with a lot of questions sur uh, surrounding sustainability and soils and soil health in particular. So it started out as a long term vision for how cropping system diversification, including crop livestock integration, affects sustainability. And one of the things that not a lot of research does that I really appreciated now taking over this experiment from um, my mentor and colleague, Matt Liebman, is that we strive to conduct research that's relevant to Iowa farmers. This includes talking, engaging, listening to farmers, getting their input to inform research. In fact, we've got uh, some new practices that are implemented. I won't have the time to talk about those, but if you're interested, I can, I can tell you more about it um, later this afternoon. And that makes the research more impactful and meaningful to, to us and, and to some of our stakeholders as well. And I consider Marsden one of the most sampled, both soils and, and plant samples as well, 16 acres of land in Iowa. So this is a long-term experiment, very valuable when it comes to at least soil scientists' perspective, since we know soils change slowly. It's got a 21-year and going record of crop data with uh, uh, each phase of the rotation represented, as I mentioned, more than 38 peer-reviewed publications, uh, dozens of collaborating scientists, including crop modelers, economists, I'm gonna show some of their data to kind of summarize the sustainability of these, uh, uh, these systems, um, nutritionists, uh, plant pathologists, and several other folks. Um, and without funding, we wouldn't have been able to keep this an experiment like this going. And there are similar ones, including Jeff Strock and others work on uh, some long-term diversification experiments here in Minnesota. And then there's some uh, WICS trial in, in Wisconsin that are very similar to this as well. So the, they're all very valuable. I, I, I collaborate with Jeff and, and folks at Wisconsin on, on kind of coordinating and, and asking some of the same questions across these states too. So our business as usual treatment is a two year rotation, corn and soybeans, synthetic fertilizer. Since we're at a nitrogen management conference, I, I'm gonna give you a little more detail on how we manage the nitrogen. Um, in this two year system prior to corn, we always put a hundred pounds of nitrogen pre-plant. Um, and then uh, we do uh, LSNT, which I think we're the only state that calls it LSNT maybe. Uh, we had a talk this morning about the PSNT, pre-side rest nitrate. All, uh, all the rest of the nitrogen gets put on according to recommendations from the LSNT or PSNT test. Um, we've got a, a three-year rotation that's corn, soybeans, oats, and red clover, and uh, uh, the oat kind of as a companion crop. The oats harvested, red clover continues on. We also have some manure uh, we use the PSNT test as well to add any synthetic. That's why mo the, there's a large manure, but there, you know, depending on the year, we'll add a little bit of synthetic fertilizer, uh, usually not a lot compared to what's going on with the red clover and manure inputs. I'm not going to talk about that third year rotation very much. I'm going to focus on this rotation, the four year, which is the longer rotation, corn, soybean, oats again, then uh, uh, alfalfa over one and a half years, and we can get uh, uh, several cuttings, of, a few cuttings of alfalfa. Again, 
Uh, most of the fertilizer is from the manure or any infixed from the alfalfa. And we do apply some synthetic depending on the year. I'll show you some of those LSNT, PSNT tests um, since I, I know my audience here. I know you all will be interested in that. But before I do that, I'm going to show some of the soil health results. Um, Rebecca was a master's student in my lab. She's now at MAD Agriculture as a farm planner. Um, some of you might know Raganko. He's a faculty here at Minnesota State here in Mankato. He, uh, he does some on-farm research and uh, works with undergrad students in research. So if you don't know him yet, um, he's a very friendly guy. If you introduce yourself to him, he'd be happy to collaborate. Okay, so from Rebecca and Morganko's work, we found many, many benefits to soil health from that four-year rotation when we compared them. And this is a very complex figure. I'm not gonna go through this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through some highlights, but if anybody is interested in this, so it's kind of a pinwheel graph, uh, uh, also called a spider web or radar plot. The blue line is the four-year rotation. The red line is the two-year. So it, the closer to the outside of those plots, the more, uh, uh, the greater the benefit it is. Um, and there are physical, chemical, biological measurements of soil health. Some of those um, acronyms you'll be, you might be able to guess, others you won't. But I'm going to be able, I'm just going to hit a few of the high, highlights, which is soil hardness. These were all collected during the corn year. Um, we measured as penetration resistance. We also measured bulk density, water infiltration that's not on this graph, but we did that in uh, conjunction with Soil Health Institute. Um, I'd never done this before, so my, my student and I went out and actually measured earthworm abundance. That was a lot of fun. I'll show you some results from that, comparing these two systems. And then I'm going to talk about soil microbial biomass, CEC. You're going to get a snapshot of all the effect of these, um, but I'm going to spend most of the time, the remainder of the time of my time on the soil nitrogen, though. Okay, let's walk through the other ones besides soil nitrogen very quickly. Penetration resistance directly related to uh, food fiber fuel provisioning, right? That's where I put that little icon in there. We found with penetrometer, the four-year rotation reduced it. So increased ease of root growth, decreased the pressure by 8%. That was statistically significant. Bulk density related to provisioning uh, of food fiber and fuel, also nutrient cycling, uh, habitat for organisms in the soil, bulk density decreased, uh, in the four year, 26% compared to the business as usual, two year rotation. Hydraulic, saturated hydraulic conductivity, or conductivity, excuse me, related to uh, flood mitigation, water purification. We found that um, the, uh, this was the largest effect by far. It, and any of you that's, that have used these Saturo machines for their new uh, equipment to measure infiltration, they're quite variable, but uh, this was st statistically significant. So for over a thousand percent increase in infiltration in the four-year rotation. Earthworm abundance, probably no surprise, related to provisioning of food, fiber, and fuel. There's some science showing the connection between earthworms and yield and crops. Happy to share that with you if you're interested. Habitat for organisms, obviously it's one of the larger organisms we can see with our eye. Nutrient cycling, earthworms increased by 71%. Microbes, we do a method called uh, chloroform fumigation extraction. So we lice or explode all the microbes in the soil. I love saying that, that we explode microbes in the soil. This is connected to provisioning food, fiber, and fuel, habitat for organisms, obviously, sequestration of carbon. I could go into uh, why that is after my talk, and nutrient cycling. And we saw a very large and consistent increase over the year, even past the corn year of the rotation happy to talk about later. Cation exchange capacity. This is the size of the piggy bank that uh, stores cationic nutrients for the plant connected to provisioning uh, food, fiber, and fuel, nutrient cycling, obviously, 16% increase. One thing I wanna say about this, those of you might have noticed I didn't mention soil carbon. And the reason is it wasn't statistically significant. So all of those benefits that were statistically significant, but not carbon. And that's what the markets are valuing right now. Just an interesting thought. I, I, I see Jeff Schmerkin over there. 
Okay, so now let me talk about the nitrogen. I just wanted to get about get that all the uh, out of the way. Um, we see overwhelming benefits to the four year rotation. And now I want to talk about a little bit of research that was done before. Well, I, I had started at Iowa State then, but uh, Matt Liebman and, and Mike Castellano advised uh, Will Osterholtz here. He's now at the USDA. Uh, but what he found when he uh, measured over uh, two corn years is that the four year actually lowered inorganic, extractable inorganic nitrogen, ammonium and nitrate, but increased the mineralization potential. And this was kind of variable by depth. He measured it at different depths and different times of the year. Um, I, I could share you, his paper with you if you're interested. And so this was in 2013, 2014. We, we did kind of a follow-up study. In that those same years, he also measured nitrogen uptake in the corn. Um, and he found one year there was no difference, 2014, but in 2013, about 45 pounds more nitrogen in the four-year rotation uh, compared to the two-year um, out later in the growing season. Okay, so now I'm gonna share, so that gives you a context of some prior work. Now my students in, uh, wanted to explore why that is. So why is there lower ammonium and nitrate, extractable ammonium and nitrate kind of throughout the growing season but there's uh, maybe more potential or nitrogen supplying power, sometimes we call it, right? So I, I wanna explain and walk you through these graphs. These are quite complex graphs. And um, the colors indicate, the darker the color is, the more stable the form of organic nitrogen, or not, I, I shouldn't say stable, but uh, uh, less plant available, right? And, in, and even though it's turning over, so MBN is microbial biomass nitrogen. That's the darkest area under the curve, both, both the two-year and four-year rotation. And then um, the kind of second darkest is salt, we call it CION. This is salt extractable organic nitrogen, right? So it's not ammonium and nitrate yet, but it's probably potentially mineralizable. And then the other two forms you're more familiar with. So the, the kind of lightish or the second lightest red and blue are nitrate, nitrogen, and ammonium nitrogen. And so I just want to show you the, the top six inches of soil first. You can see the two years much more variable. But the other thing that, that probably jumps out to you is that there's a lot less nitrogen in the extract salt extractable and microbial biomass in that two year rotation than the four year. And, it, and you can look over the, the um, entire growing season here too. And there's very little ammonium. So that second color is the nitrate and tracking over the, the corn year. If we look below six inches and we look at the six to 12 inch depth, we even see bigger differences. So there's more nitrogen in microbial biomass and that salt, salt extractable organic nitrogen and about the same, maybe a little bit less nitrate in that six to 12 inch depth. And if we, so I, I, I subtracted the average difference in that micro, just the microbial biomass pool. And that's, if you use the average bulk density we had, it's about 50 pounds of nitrogen difference in microbial biomass. So that microbial biomass that's turning over, probably releasing nitrogen responsible for some of that greater uptake later in the growing season. We don't know for sure yet. We can't do, we, we can't confirm that unless we were able to do some isotope studies. This is the second year. So now we're in soybean. We're at least one year since manure has been applied. And um, no, nit no nitrogen, we haven't applied any pre-plant or side dress nitrogen now. And you can see that kind of decline in all pools of nitrogen. But again, the, the large overwhelming difference in the nitrogen that's in microbial biomass uh, compared to the, the two year. And we see it at depth too. So if we look at the six to 12, we can see that, that effect. And we haven't done stats on this. This is kind of brand new uh, um, findings. We haven't published it yet. And some of you are saying, well, uh, maybe you've been adding manure, you've got alfalfa in rotation, uh, you probably have greater total nitrogen, right? And we do on average, but again, this isn't statistically significant, just like soil carbon wasn't. But 
what I did here was look at the proportion of those pools to total. And you can see they're all less than 2%. If you sum all of them up, what's in the microbes, organic extractable nitrogen. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, this, those of you that might be familiar with the Haney test, it's similar to the water extractable organic nitrogen, um, and then ammonium and nitrate. And even if you look at a proportion of total, there's much more in organic uh, forms of the microbial biomass and the salt extractable and lower in nitrate and ammonium for that, that matter. Okay, so what does that mean for fertility management? So I pulled out an old document. Some of you might know my also retired colleague, uh, John Sawyer. I've got actually got a job ad that I'm gonna promote before I conclude here. But um, 25 parts per million is our critical value for our LSNT test or PSNT. Um, and for the two year, that would be 25 right there. This is, I think this is like 10 or 12 years out of the history at Marsden. Uh, the box plot just shows you the range and how variable it is. The blue line is for corn after an alfalfa manuring. And so if you have below 15 ppm, then you would fertilize. So the majority of those um, years don't get any uh, side dress nitrogen, whereas all of the, the years, um, almost all except a handful of the two year also get, besides the 100 pounds up front, they get um, uh, some supplemental at side dress too. Okay, uh, quickly here, I'm gonna show some nitrate. So you might think, okay, wow, there's a lot of nitrogen in the, the four year or, or a greater nitrogen um, supplying power. What does that mean? Maybe there's more nitrogen leached um, in, in, uh, in, uh, and to tile waters. And so these are actually not tile drain sites, but we do have lysimeters at uh, about four feet deep. And what we found is that the four year reduces in seven out of nine years, the average nitrate concentration that's measured at least twice a month over the growing season uh, with about a 10% decrease in nitrate at, the, at four, four feet deep. And the, just for reference, the EPA standard um, is 10 parts per million. And then we see even a, a greater effect in the soybean year Six out of nine uh, years reduce. And so those purple lines are when the four year actually reduced uh, uh, nitrate concentration at that depth. The dotted gray are where they increased it. So six out of nine, but an overall greater decrease if you were to average it. And it, uh, the, the median is now below the, the EPA standard, if that means anything. Okay, now just to wrap things up quickly, I wanna make sure I've got time to put in a, a promotion for a job. Uh, this is a, a summary table. Now that goes over not just the water quality, but also some of the productivity and profitability uh, uh, stats and also some external inputs. Uh, the corn yield is on average greater, just about 5% greater uh, over the, the 20 year record we've got. Soybean yield is much greater impacts, 20% greater soybean yields. We think that's because of disease suppression, maybe not necessarily related to the nitrogen supplying power. If you look at whole net profitability, it's about 6% more profitable. It's not statistically significant at the plot scale. Um, and then the, uh, the, the dollars per acre shown there. Um, synthetic fertilizer, we can cut that cost. Brian just showed synthetic the high price of synthetic fertilizer. So we can decrease it almost to 90%, 86% on average in the four-year rotation. Or we decrease herbicide use by 50%, fossil fuel energy use 65%. Other kind of environmental impact, I already mentioned the water quality. If you look on average across corn and soybeans, 22% uh, decrease. Uh, soil erosion reduction, is a 62% decrease. Uh, if you're interested in this, just send me an email to learn more about where. So on the right-hand side of that table are all the references where those data were either collected empirically or models were used to get it. Okay, just to wrap things up, humans are prone to progress bias. I mentioned what that progress bias is. 
Sometimes it might be worth looking backwards at the benefits of soil health compare, especially when you're looking at high fertilizer prices. I use one of these DTN figures that Brian used as well. And uh, besides looking at just crop yields, and these, hopefully I've demonstrated to you these benefits of these diversified perennial rotations, like the four-year rotation that we studied in this long-term experiment, reduced fertilizer nitrogen needs, and had a greater nitrogen or tighter nitrogen cycle. And can we look for other ways to re-diversify re farms in the Midwest US to capture some of these agronomic and environmental benefits that are kind of increasingly valued, not just uh, valued from a uh, 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 kind of perspective, but also maybe monetary value on some of those things as well, like water quality, the carbon markets are an example of this. As I said, I'm here to also promote, we have a, a new position, John Sawyer, I, 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 yeah, I've talked to a few people about this already. John Sawyer retired a couple of years ago, my colleague. Um, we're, we've got a nitrogen management position. So if you know any good students, PhD students close to finishing, postdocs, the job closes within a few weeks. But I think until we've got enough candidates, I think it remains open. So please get the word out. You can email me. I'm not on the, the, the search committee. Uh, my department chair's email is up there and I, I can send you the link to find out more about this position if you have any questions. Um, and at this time, I'd be happy to take any questions or either online or in person. Thank you. Uh, the first question here online, I don't see any in here is, from this research, a conclusion would be that increasing soil health will allow us to reduce nitrogen fertilizer recommendations. Yeah, I think that's, that's uh, hopefully I made that clear. One from the, the LSNT or PSNT test, we only had to fertilize a few out of all those years that I showed those values, at least from our fertilizer recommendations. Um, and uh, what I didn't get to show you, as I said, I don't think I'd, I'd, I'd have enough time, but um, uh, some folks, uh, both in the Midwest and other parts of the United States, have shown the connection between soil health and nitrogen rates or nitrogen supplying power through the CO2 burst tests. Alan Franzluber is one of those, and I had some slides that I was happy to share, but I'll talk more with folks if they're interested in hearing about that and my thoughts on that. But yes, I think there is a connection. Any other questions? Yes. 